Welcome one and all to the Damage Board. I'm John Arola. He is Brett Ehrlich. That's what I've heard. Confirm or deny this, sir. Listen, you know my social security number is your phone number. So basically, you know I exist, <laughs> period. My Has passwords are ever- all Johnny Ampersand Brett sitting in a tree doing the damage report with lots of glee. But yes, that is a euphemism for intercourse. How are you doing? How's everybody doing today? <laughs> Friday. You had this sort of nice Christmas Carol vibe to it, and then you suddenly veered off into Nancy Mace territory. So Dude, that's I'd great. Watch, I'd watch Nancy Mace and her fiance. She's a good-looking woman. Legislate. <laughs> Legislate. Pass. Pass laws. Pound the gavel, as as it were. I don't know what happened, John. I think you did this to us. Okay, I have like three more weeks until my leave. I would like to not be fired before that time or have my show when, canceled. So when you, when you sign off for your leave, can you say I take my leave of thee and then just storm off like it's a point. very Shakespearean exeunt? I want the audience to know that to wrangle Brett takes a certain amount of energy and sometimes I'm up for that. But I'm just exhausted deep down into my bone marrow every day and I can't do it anymore. And, I just I'm can't sh- do it. I'm sure little baby Bertina is going to absolutely hear that and say, "Oh, I'll go by your schedule now, John, Daddy, Dragon Daddy." Okay, Daenerysa. Here's I guess I don't have to turn that into a girl name. I do wish that was the name, Um, but unfortunately, I was overruled on. Daenerys, I would say that what happened in the the latter part of uh, Game of Thrones not only angered a lot of fans, I don't particularly mind it, but it angered a lot of fans. It also made it a lot harder to sell that name for your child, unfortunately. Yeah. So <laughs> I take personal issue with it now. Um, anyway, okay, everyone, we've got a lot that we're gonna be talking about news wise on the show. I don't know if you heard this, but Trump's facing even more indictments. I think that makes 700. Indictments, I think, I think we're exactly 700 now. So we're gonna be breaking that down. We will in fact be talking about Nancy Mace, less because of what Nancy Mace said, and more because of like, oh dear God, are conservatives the worst? We're talking about that, we've got the Oligarch Act. Um, Brett and I will probably argue uh, viciously over that. Uh, Diane Feinstein deciding to take some of the pressure off of Mitch McConnell, very nice of her. And we're going to identify a true D bag. I can say D bag, right? Can I say you can D? say douchebag, John? It is so weird. Everybody, everyone just meeting John for the first time. He has the weirdest like. Is this a swear? He'll say the he'll say D picks. He'll say the whole word. He'll say the male because copulatory organ. This isn't the. I'm not the weird one. The standards for media are the weird thing. Why Ooh. is that a swear? It, it, it doesn't it make sense. Anyway, we're not we're not gonna have this fight right now. I'm I'm right. Society is wrong. I think that we all understand so that at a very deep, intimate level. Anyway, we will be identifying a true D. Like you know how like they'll have like the the congressperson's name and then it'll be like D Pennsylvania or R. Well, he's a D even though he's not a Democrat. I'll say that. And uh, that's just in the first hour. In the aftermath, we will be doing some animal news. My favorite pig. I think we'll be profiling and we will have garbage people of the week. And someday I will go back to remembering to have the garbage can ready to go at the outset of the show, but not today. Anyway, along the way, please hit the like button, share the stream, send us your comments. Although I'm gonna let you know ahead of time, um, I already know who's gonna get the Blue Apron gift card because someone uh, correctly guessed uh, the name of my coming heir. Uh, So I will be recognizing them during the first social break. So stay tuned for that. And with all that, Brett, are you ready? Whether I am or not, you've been more than fair. Okay, that was that was fine. I like that. That was nice. You didn't do anything weird there. Okay. <laughs> President Donald Trump is facing more indictments. I didn't know there were any more to give. I thought that we had reached some sort of supply chain issue with indictments, but they found them. He's facing three more. This is now 40 specific to the classified documents case. He's facing all sorts of other charges and there are way more charges still to come on January 6th, the fake electors plot, Fulton County, all of that. We're focusing on the classified documents today. And here's what was revealed. We knew that this was coming yesterday 
and here it is. The revised indictment added three serious charges against Trump. So that includes attempting to quote, alter, destroy, mutilate, or conceal evidence, inducing someone else to do so, and a new count under the Espionage Act related to a classified national security document that he showed to visitors at his golf club in Bedminster, New Jersey. That last one is not what we're gonna be focusing on here, but that does appear to be in reference to the Iran war plans that he showed off to a journalist. So we had been wondering, Where's that one? Like that was the most individually compelling document and it had not yet been included in the indictments. It now is, so add that to the whole Espionage Act thing. No, we're gonna be focusing on the destruction of evidence because Donald Trump has committed so many own goals already and he decided to do the thing that is not gonna break through to his base, I get that. but. There's been a lot of talk about how getting people to understand the significance of taking these documents can for some people be a little bit difficult. It's a little bit abstract. Some people are like, well, can't presidents have that stuff? And he's muddying the waters with his thing about the Sox Act or whatever, it's all lies. But, but it is muddied waters. What people do understand, I think on a very visceral level is when you are trying to destroy evidence, they get that that does not make you the good guy. That's a bad thing, you cannot destroy surveillance tapes and things like that. And so we're gonna dive into all of the evidence that was presented. But just briefly, Brett, what do you think about this superseding indictment? All the indictments, each additional indictment that comes out just is reinforcing an existing narrative. None of this is like creating some new blockbuster situation. It's just reminding people like normie Americans that Donald Trump's just too much, dude. Like mm -hmm. there's a lot that Donald Trump does that endears him to the public. Like having strange reading material in your bathroom is something that on a certain level is endearing and normal. But when that reading material in your bathroom is like classified secrets that are stacked like really high in ways that like your wife would get mad at you if you stacked it like that in the, if you did anything like that in the bathroom. Like that's where it starts getting weird. And mm -hmm. the idea that like a lot of people are like, all right, this guy's gonna tear down the normal BS that people do when they get to certain levels of power. Well, that dissolves when this guy himself is just using his access to secrets, not to fix the world, but to brag that that the idiot Americans gave him this kind of stuff that he's either flouting to the entire, you know, flaunting to the entire world, or potentially mm -hmm. given its juxtaposition to the toilet, wiping his butt with. Yeah, yeah, that isn't yet in the indictment, but you know, Jack Smith seems perfectly willing to add new charges, so we'll see if anything related to his butt gets added. In any event, Let's dive into what's actually in this indictment. The apparent evidence with a case they're gonna make that Donald Trump conspired with some of his employees to destroy evidence to impede the investigation into the stolen classified documents. So it says that in late June of last year, shortly after the government demanded surveillance footage as part of its inquiry. So they knew the government was looking for the, the tapes. Mr. Trump called Mr. Carlos de Oliveira and they spoke for 24 minutes. Two days later, Mr. Nada, that's Walt Nada, who's already been charged in this previously, and Mr. De Oliveira went to the security guard booth where surveillance video is displayed on monitors, walked with a flashlight through the tunnel where the storage room is located, and observed and pointed out surveillance cameras. So it's almost like they were like trying to make the case on the tapes that they were doing something wrong. They go to the place where the tapes are kept. They go to the place where the documents would be removed from. And then along the way, they look for whatever cameras could have seen people moving between those different areas. A few days after that, the new employee de Oliveira went to see Mr. Yusil Tavares, who is identified in the indictment as Trump employee four. He apparently is the employee who oversees the surveillance camera footage at the property. So Walt Nauda, personal aide, you had Oliveira, property manager, and now you have the guy who actually oversees the surveillance system there. And when they talk to him, um, they take him to a small room known as an audio closet. Then the two men had a conversation that was meant to quote, remain between the two of them, which is always a good sign. It was then that Oliveira told Mr. Tavares that quote, the boss wanted the server deleted, 
referring to the computer server that holds the security footage. Mr. Tavares objected and said he didn't know how to delete the server and did not think that he had the right to do so. So an oddly stand up guy for the Trump organization so far. But at that point, De Oliveira insisted again that quote, the boss wanted the server deleted asking, what are we gonna do? That's not the only suspicious conversation cited in the superseding indictment. Previously, Mr. Nada had been quoted as saying to another Trump employee, someone just wants to make sure Carlos is good. In response, that employee told Mr. Nauda that Mr. De Oliveira was quote, loyal and would quote, not do anything to affect his relationship with Mr. Trump. After that conversation, Trump called De Oliveira and said that he would get him a lawyer. Look, what I what I would like to know is I would like confirmation of exactly who is providing all this information. How much of this information was itself caught on surveillance tapes? How much of the evidence was actually destroyed? Because the indictment interestingly does not actually say that they did end up destroying evidence. It just says that they had been plotting to destroy evidence and that apparently Trump the boss is implicated in trying to get his employees, both the ones who have already like proved that they have personal loyalty to him as well as others that he is trying to co-opt into this plot. Um, and we do have to remember of course that a pool leak had destroyed some computer systems. That is not actually mentioned in this either. I guess it was just a coincidence. Anyway, Brett, what do you make of uh, these new claims? Uh, I think this is amazing. I think all of this is, it's it's treading into the the area that a lot of Americans of a certain age are familiar with. Like this is Watergate type stuff, this is, Surveillance catching you guys being like, can we crime? I would love to crime, <laughs> let's crime. And that's it, and and the truth is like, at no point was anyone like, yo, Nixon really is sticking it to the system. And, and he, I need him on that wall, you know, no one's like that with Nixon. Why should they be like that with Trump? None of this activity that's coming to light is really going, you know, dovetailing with uh, Trump's personal brand of guy who sticks it to the deep state. This is very deep statey activity. This is delete the surveillance video, mm -hmm. and you can't you can't do that. You can't justify that. But what's weird is all the Trump people want this special treatment. They want to go at they're they're saying, well, everybody else is doing it, but they don't take the next step that people like me would take. And I I've heard John say it where it's like. Yeah, if it happens that all of these people, Hillary, Biden, I don't know why you think I have this special loyalty that you have where you're asking for special treatment, but I'm not asking for that. I'm saying hold everyone to the same standard. You're yeah. using that as some kind of whataboutism defense. I'm saying like, listen, if if this whole thing is set up so that queen takes queen and pawn takes queen, like I get them off the board, I don't care. Yeah. Hundred percent. It's 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 what aboutism always is, which is using the illusion of an even standard to advocate for no standard. Right. That's what it is. It is not saying we in fact want both to be treated the same. It's saying I'm going to bring this up, and then can we just stop talking about this? That's what it's for. Now I I, I want to turn to the responses to this because. You would assume this would demand a response. I mean, if they have good evidence of this, if they have someone who has flipped, and I have at this point a suspicion of who it might have been, Walt Nauta for some reason has decided to hitch his wagon, which is headed straight off a cliff to Donald Trump. But maybe Tavares has not. Somebody involved in all these conversations was was talking about this stuff. Then this is this is just damning. You cannot destroy tapes. It's so suspicious. But let's see if the right is going to take it seriously. Now, we're going to start off our responses to the new indictments with Donald Trump. It's only fair. He's now being charged with even more crimes in the classified documents. Forty indictments. And here is what he has to say. He's clearly taking this seriously. Whatever happened to the crooked Joe Biden documents case? He why is documents possessive there? He had 20 times more capital B boxes than I did, and he wasn't covered by the Presidential Records Act. I was. He wasn't. When it first came out that Biden had all of these docs, 
doctors, many classified, almost everyone, including those on the left said, there goes the case against Trump. But they waited and waited, got failed prosecutor, deranged Jack Smith and struck. But did almost nothing on the really bad Biden documents case, many stored in Chinatown. That is true. You get double the years in prison if they were stored in Chinatown. That's fair. So um, he didn't mention the destruction of the evidence. He didn't mention the plot too. He didn't mention why his employees are talking about him as if he is a literal mob boss. Nothing. He's not even denying that it happened. He's not denying. He's not defending it if it did happen. He's not denying that it happened. That leads me to believe that it happened. Again, my opinion in this case is irrelevant, but. He's not really defending himself. That is gonna fall to other Republicans. So very briefly, Brett, what do you make of his response here? Great response, let him go, let (laughs) him go. He said he's innocent, he says the other guy's bad. Let's just take it at face value, move on, kind of do the coefficient of Chinatown, which is like racism times 0.5, 1.5, because it's like, it just sounds worse. Because he doesn't explain it, you know what I mean? That yeah. makes it more racist than like explaining why Chinatown is bad. So let him go. Yeah, it's it's like it's like he just he starts to get ants under his skin if one of his bleats doesn't involve racism. So he just needs to add it in for no good reason whatsoever. Yep. But anyway, okay, set him aside. He's not a serious person, um, you know, in the succession sense. Uh, here is Elise Stefanik, who. Not that long ago, it was supposed to be a more serious Republican. So she has now been presented with Jack Smith believing that they have a solid case. And remember, he's not gonna go with anything that they don't have solid evidence for because the deck is already so stacked against any case being made against the president. She's been presented with evidence, or the case at least, that he was doing this plot to try to get evidence to be destroyed. And she says, it is no coincidence that the day after a federal judge throws out Hunter Biden's corrupt sweetheart plea deal bargain, Biden's weaponized DOJ continues its witch hunt against President Trump. Our republic is in peril, our justice system is broken. I'll give her the Republican peril part. I think that she's got a case to make there. But um, again, you'll notice, and it's it's so weird. She must have been rushed for time. Uh, she didn't defend it if it happened. She didn't deny that it happened. She just talked past it and laid out, admittedly, I think a very plausible case. I think that the judge uh, temporarily paused Hunter Biden's plea deal, and Jack Smith was like, "What are we gonna do?" Okay. Uh, what if he did a Nixon? And then uh, we're gonna put together this whole thing. We're gonna go through multiple filings and everything. By the way, they talked to Trump's lawyers yesterday morning, like when that news with Hunter Biden had just happened. The idea that they're doing it in response is so, it should be below even the most red hat wearing Trump fan. But this is all they've got. They cannot actually defend the behavior. If we found out that Joe Biden had told Hunter Biden to tell Rahm Emanuel to destroy a tape about Burisma, there would literally never be anything else talked about on the right. And yet in this case, they're they're just talking past it, Brett. The psychology of this is very established in Politics and newly in MAGA world. So, and 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 I wouldn't even say newly in MAGA world, but it's just like a new thing that everybody has kind of developed, whether they know it or not, as like this this typical behavior. So the first thing you do is you always in politics just talk past the situation. That's just what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to stay on message. It's called, and that message is that Biden is corrupt. Um, and mm-hmm. when someone says Trump is corrupt, you, the the thing that everybody notices works is if you say, well, let's get into the specifics of that scenario you pointed out and point out the subtle differences. No, 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 no. Everybody's like, oh, they're in it. We're only talking about this for more time. But it, what you do is you kind of try to put up the deflector shield and go toward uh, Biden, right? But the difference now. Is this specific thing about like redirecting it toward Biden? There's all these things that you now, through the apparatus of Fox News, have taught your viewers to do the same thing that the politicians do without thinking it through, though. The politicians know why they're doing it. The viewers, as our own interviews with MAGA Republicans prove, if you just ask, you know, people will say, well, Biden's corrupt. And then if you do a follow up to the individual who's not the frickin' 
um, the politician, the individual on the street, you'll, you'll say like, what? so if they're both corrupt, if they're both doing the same thing and that thing is corrupt, should we throw them in jail? The supporters are like, I don't know. But mm-hmm. the point is never to put two people who disagree in the same sphere online or anywhere else in a way that you know generates actual conversations. It's interesting that it actually like has made its way down to the populace who um, feels like that po- political operative now being able yeah. to just say, well, I'm gonna say things like woke and uh, death tax and Bidenism and you know Bi- and, and Burisma and that that's like my get out of thinking free card. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I like your point about the the regular MAGA voter too. Though um, they they don't necessarily know, and I I think they look to figures they have been told to trust to understand how to navigate this stuff, which is why it sucks when people like this that should have some sort of base standard for ethics don't. Uh, Josh Hawley says we, we have a graphic. It's the exact same thing, at least Stefanik. It's blah blah blah. There's something Hunter Biden. I'm not going to engage with this. Um, DeSantis asked if it should disqual the new indictment should disqualify him for 2024. Says voters make those decisions. You weaselly little pudding faced coward of a man. He's so yeah, bad. voters do make decisions. <laughs> How you liking the decisions they've been making so far, Ron DeSantis? They sure seem to be big fans of you. DeSantis so, is so weasel. he's so many people, he's no people. That's DeSantis. <laughs> like there's a photo of him in Iowa in jeans and boots that he's trying to go like buy something at the local store, get a snack, and he decides like for a Luna bar or something or like a uh, you know, one of those like nut bars and not like Doritos. He think he gets real close to being a person, but then he's like, "Give me the responsible bar. I am a dork." And but he but he's trying to be a man of the people. He's flailing so miserably in his vests and his jeans and his like fake work shirts, like yeah, uh, blue he, collar worker shirts. He's so pathetic. He really seems to think that the key to him breaking through is to do one of those like late 90s, early 2000s, like go into the mall makeover montages. (laughs) Where like he just has like, I don't know, a couple of his fans sitting and like watching and like a really like like a a catchy song comes on and he just keeps opening up the curtain. (laughs) And then they just keep doing this and it's revealing another like outfit. (laughs) Yeah, 100%. I think we're all thinking about the sweetest thing. I think we're all thinking about the movie The Sweetest Thing. No, I was I was thinking of the one where DJ Most Qualls meta. goes to a new high school and tries to reinvent himself as like DJ the Qu- cool kid. If you want to know what my body type was again. in high school, it was DJ Qualls. <laughs> that is funny. I have not seen that movie in a long pounds, time. Six feet tall. Okay, well, I apologize for the trauma that you're still holding. The new guy, yes. Which I watched because of DJ Qualls, not because of Eliza Dushku. Anyway, with that said, this is pathetic. Almost no one is willing to actually criticize himself. There is one person who is willing to, and I'm gonna play this video, understanding that most of you are going to change the channel when you see his face based on the view count of videos featuring him. But here's Chris Christie. Your former prosecutor, have you ever heard of someone facing between four and six trials within a few months for different legal issues. No, no, um, usually uh, folks like this commit discrete crimes <laughs> that wind up having one trial. Um, this guy um, is been a one man crime wave. Mm-hmm. And look, he's earned every one of them. If you look at it, every one of these is self inflicted. He is a one man crime wave of self inflicted wounds. That is 100% accurate. That's all it is. Like, he did so many things that should be wildly illegal as president. The sort of thing that lots of presidents do that we can't touch. We can't do anything about it. The, the fact that Kushner got $2 billion, not illegal, nothing we could do about it, wildly corrupt, but we can't do anything about it. He decided to just spend every day doing such tiny, petty, needless self-destructive crimes that we can actually grapple with. He didn't need to do any of this stuff, Brett. And I know that Chris Christie is apparently never gonna break 3% or whatever, but like how much better off would they be if they just had someone who can who can see reality 
will still give them trillions in tax cuts. Like they should want Chris Christie. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Chris Christie, who goes on and like uh, shadow boxes with Rahm Emanuel, like they don't agree on everything mm-hmm. uh, on those Sunday shows. That's that's the thing. It's Pod Save America. Like he's in. Those are all the Obama Bros that now have their podcast empire, right? And he's going there because they all know each other and they hug and they kiss and they squeeze. That's the difference between Chris Christie and Donald Trump, period. Um, And the argument is like, oh, he's just like this. Like Trump's just like that. That's just how he is. That's that's what you that's how you have to be and be like you take the bitter with the sweet with Donald Trump. But it's just so stupid that that's the reason why they don't understand that's why that and COVID, which no one who's a political operative should bring up. But uh, that and COVID are the reason he lost the election. It was like people yeah. are dying and this guy's annoying. I agree, I agree. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna see what happens with this. Maybe we'll get more details. Maybe Trump will be, I don't know. We'll talk a little bit more about the actual claims and maybe do some more legal damage himself. Stay tuned to find out, we'll be back in a few. Anyway, uh, stone to the bone, Steph Mont, send in emails, rewards at tyt.com. We'll talk more about it. I'm a little bit giddy now that I've revealed the name. I am. I it's am. very great. He revealed the name in what we call a social break. So if you do not, if you're not a member or you're watching on television, there are many ways that you can enjoy the social breaks by, you know, uh, you know, becoming a member, subscribing, or you know, some sub on fa- on Twitch, and becoming a member on YouTube. You can, yes, or tyt.com. You can. Okay, with that, let's mix it up. Let's go a little wild, starting with this. I woke up this morning at 7. I was getting picked up at 7.45. Patrick, my fiance, tried to pull me by my waist over this morning in bed. And I was like, no, baby, we don't got time for that this morning. Uh, I got to get to the prayer breakfast. And I got to be on time. And a little TMI. But um, I, I hope he can wait. He's got, we got, I'll see him later tonight. What the hell is going on? That that isn't just a. I want to be very clear. I know that most of you have already seen this. That is not just a speech about narrowly dodging morning sex to go to a prayer breakfast. That's a speech about narrowly dodging morning morning sex to go to a prayer breakfast at the prayer breakfast. That is such a weird choice. Now I want to be very clear though. I don't care. A prayer breakfast is not actually a supernatural thing. It's just a great, it's a media for people. Like she can talk about it the same as she can anyway. It just seems for a person on that side of the aisle, a part of that religion and ideology, it seems like a weird choice. Bro, what do you think? Hey, listen, this is my favorite video I've seen quite some time. <laughs> Nancy Mace just picturing her, you know, she's beautiful. Uh, wait, what? Oh, grabbed what? by the waist, prayer breakfast. Like, it's everything I want because it also exposes like this weird puritanical instinct among Republicans where now they're mad and I'm just like giddy. I love it. <laughs> also, like, she loves, she loves this, like, um, this like masochistic thing, right? Like she's become like this Trump lover after he primaried her in New York. Like she likes it a little like that. And I'm for it because I'm sex okay. positive. I'm I love everything about this story. Back. I love that the prayer breakfast still exists. I love that TYT is exposing how utterly corrupt and ridiculous it is all the time through Jonathan Larson's reporting about how it's like an international cabal of people who are the least Jesus-y of all the people, which they go to and glad hand each other and shake hands and go try to like ruin people's lives in Latin America and then get mad when they have to, when they try to come to America. Like it is, it is perfect. Like the prayer breakfast is the movie I need to come out after they fix the writer's strike issue. I expected that you would like this story. You like it more than I thought you would and more than I would prefer that you would. But anyway, yeah, no, me too. I'm not um, proud of okay. my feelings, John, but I've learned I, to accept them. I'm sure it's rare. Anyway, um, so Nancy Mace, look, uh, it's a weird opportunity to tell that story, but I don't have a problem with it. You know who does have a problem with it? 
all the people who agree with her in like 99% of policies and they're attacking her viciously. All of these people have followings on the right. I'm not gonna define which ones cuz I honestly don't care. Some of them are religious, some of them are politicians, some of them are pundits. It's all the same, they're all the same thing these days. Tom Askell says how thoughtful for Nancy Mace to delay fornication so she could show up on time for vote Tim Scott's prayer breakfast. It reminds me of a line from that old song, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. You see, she's going to hell because she didn't have sex. Anyway, uh, Graham Allen, Nancy Mace just said she turned down sex from her not husband, but her fiance this morning in bed because she had to get to the prayer breakfast. I'll take what is a sin for 500, Alex. Nobody was asking you. Literally, nobody Alex was asking Alex is dead too, you weirdo. Yeah, that's so weird. Laverne Spicer just responded, that's some ho talk. Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Young, who I think is different than Tim Pool, I'm not sure, says, Barely. here's your daily reminder that Nancy Mace is trash. Tr She's trash because of that anecdote? What is wrong with you weirdos? You cannot sell. In a world where my dear friend and ally Marjorie Taylor Greene is trash. <laughs> <laughs> you can't look at Nancy hey, Nancy watching. Mace and convince people not to like that. That is it utter it make accessibility you like her and humanity and non-fakeness on display. That is a that is confession. Yeah. That's what she did. She <laughs> laid bare her soul. God, I shouldn't use those words in front of all of God's people. Yeah. And they rake her over the coals for it. Need I point out Mary Magdalene's job, my friends? Mm -hmm. I'm familiar with it, actually. That was uh, every time she's quoted in the Bible, that was by definition some ho talk. Uh, and what we can say for sure is that none of these men ever had sex before marriage. Oh my God, I no hope that's their messaging going forward. forward. Um, Abstinence, guys, never bang. Never bang. I mean, and if you do, you're going to hell. And we, yet yeah. ye, who, yet he who is without mourning, you Shut know, up. glory. Yes, past the first. Okay, step. so here is Nancy Mace's reply to some of this, saying, "I go to church because I'm a sinner, not a saint. Glad those in attendance, including Tim Scott, my pastor, took this joke in stride. Pastor Greg and I will have to talk extra about it on Sunday." So she's having fun with it. This is the sort of moment that, like. I know that they're all they're all supposed to be like human or whatever. This is actually kind of like a humanizing thing. And that does not make her ho Go ahead. Sorry. It does not make her a ho, it doesn't make her trash. That is ridiculous. Now, if you did want to make the case that she's trash, I will remind you that following January 6, she attacked and mocked AOC for revealing that she was terrified that she might be murdered or raped. And AOC had to respond to that because she was astounded by the fact that Nancy Mace was mocking her for that, considering that both AOC and Nancy Mace have previously revealed that they've been victims of sexual assault. So mocking someone who's already been sexually assaulted for their fears of a mob of deranged weirdos raping her. That could be a good case for you being trash, I suppose, but not having a little joke about your sex life. And also, and that's what Christianity is truly about, sinning nonstop and then just saying you feel bad about it and it's okay because you like, it quote, asked for forgiveness, even if it doesn't change your behavior going forward. That's that's really what Christianity is all about. And that oh is God. It's called the God trick. Marjorie Green is definitely going to tweet about that. I don't think she's going to like that. Anyway, I already called um, her my friend and ally, and I she is I, your friend and ally. She's a sinner, and that is a compliment in mm -hmm. the in the in the Christian faith is to call someone a sinner. That's what you do, and then they say thank you. I think, and it's yes. not masochistic. At all. We're gonna there move on to our next topic. <laughs> we have three topics to get to in this hour. We're gonna try to do that. Uh, this is gonna be a quick conversation because Brett is not gonna have a problem with this at all. A group of progressive lawmakers early this week proposed a new wealth tax that would automatically modulate, potentially rising during periods of surging inequality, and then go back down once inequality moderates. It's sort of a financial tax incentive for more financial equality throughout America. 
This is the Oppose Limitless Inequality Growth and Reverse Community Harms Act, which, oh my God, that spells out oligarch. What are the they odds? must have been astounded when they got that final phrase. Anyway, I, I'm, I don't think politicians should do this anymore. Stop spelling <laughs> words. But, but I like all these people. All these people get Barbara Lee, Summer Lee, Rashida Tlaib, Jamal Bowman, good representatives. Barbara Lee, who's leading the charge on this, says inequality in the US is worse in 2023 than it was during the Gilded Age. It's unacceptable that millions of hardworking people remain impoverished while the top 0.1% holds over 20% of the nation's wealth. And so here is like a basic idea of how it might work. So if you have between 1000 and 10,000 times the median household wealth, it would be a 2% tax, a tax on the wealth between that, not all of the lesser wealth that's way more than regular people have. And then you can see in that chart that eventually it gets up to 8% for all of the wealth over 1 million times the median household wealth. Uh, now, then you might wonder, well, how exactly do you define that? What amount is that? Well, we think that that highest threshold might be $50 billion. The lowest threshold being $50 million. So this would not affect anyone with less than $50 million in wealth and the actual threshold for it would modulate. So the more quality we have, the fewer people, even rich people who would be affected by that. Um, this is different by the way than like Elizabeth Warren's proposed wealth tax from several years ago. Brett, what do you make of it? These are the hardest ones to really understand because uh, <laughs> What I like about this one is it puts it relative to everyone else. And this is this is really where the rubber meets the road in ethics and in and, and, uh, and like world building, I guess, or you know, the society designing, which is like, are you concerned with the ends or the means that you get that get you there? Now, I typically gravitate toward making the system make sense along the way. This is a wealth taxes are when you're like the system's so screwed that we're just going to break from any real justification of how taxes work, period. And just like say, all right, this goes there. Get rid of that. That's too much. It's like a speed limit. You've gone too fast. I have harder, it's harder to justify that ethically because everybody can say, I played by the rules along the way. Why didn't you change those rules? And I always pointed things like stock buybacks should be limited, payoffs to shareholders should be limited along the way. That's how they get that cash anyway. I don't like taking stuff from people just because they have it. I like as you get it, because you have it, I property taxes I'm for, like, but that's based on the value of something. But a lot well, isn't of this- that just taking it because you have it then? Well, that's you no, know, that's um that's something that it has been around long enough where it's like your calculations of how to be a person, it, it always revolves around that. And those are legislated periodically. Different states have set them up in ways that you can make your calculations along the way. What ends up happening when you do something like this is it's like, oh crap, what do you know? A lot of this goes where, and I don't like the precedent of like, we're just gonna take 8% of everything you have now. Not not that you made, but well, that would everything be that you have 8 now. 8% of what you have over, I believe $120 billion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I agree that there's definitely a thing where when taxes have been a certain way for a long time, that seems natural. And I agree, you would want some sort of like philosophical rationale for this. But like, is there a clear philosophical rationale for taxing income or sales? Like there's, yeah, yeah. you, you think that there's some sort of cosmic sense to that that is not present for taxing wealth, which is by the way, because the wealthy make 99% of their wealth, not through income, but instead through passive means is simply another way of getting around to taxing their income. It's just in a different form. Yeah, but this is this is like closer to like, just give it, give me what you have mm-hmm. because you have it. Not but is what sales you tax not that, like that's you sales tax no, taxing like on the money you had. had so my point is it's at the point of economic activity. Well, why is that philosophically significant? It just you, because, you are benefiting because from the country you live in in a variety of ways. I think a philosophical case could be made that the rich benefit from that far many times over the poorest Americans. 
you are paying towards that system. We tax that in a variety of different ways. I get, I, just, I get what you're saying, and I, I just like- I just don't like that what ends up happening is like, oh, and then like a lot of this goes to, well, you have a house and we've decided that owning a house is not okay anymore. We're gonna take it so that we as the government can say like, everybody can live in these places now. It's no longer yours. That's the philosoph- like all of my frameworks for how to deal with society are are like, listen, people are corrupt, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I like progressivism because it's just ground rules more than it is, uh, you know. I don't like things that are like the government should control it. I'm like the government is people, like government should control everything. No, they shouldn't. There should be checks along the way. There should be, you know, if if you're the same people that run the the oligarchs now are gonna find their way into control of the system. Eventually you need checks along the way and and I look Uh at like where it's gonna go. Justice is fairness. I always, you know, it's Rawlsian justice is fairness, and I think that fairness is like setting up a system so that on the way to to making your fortune, you have to participate in a way that is fair. Um, regressive taxes, like sales taxes, if they're the only thing, that's no longer fair. Because, but income tax counterbalances that. That's that. I don't know, you asked me to explain okay. it. That's how I feel. No, no, I, I do, didn't say I'm against we, we it. I'm saying this is the hardest one to do because I've talked to like people with over a hundred million dollars and they say, yeah, tax me well, tax, I don't care. You need it. You should do that. Okay. Well, it's something that we should continue to talk about. I wish that the Democrats had control at least so that it was possible because obviously this is not gonna pass the House. But uh, I understand what you're saying. Uh, I was raised under a system where you get used to certain taxes too. I don't necessarily I don't think that the conception of taxation that we have having to be tied to individual transactions of either you gaining or losing money. I don't think that that has some sort of like to me sacred significance, but I hear what you're saying. Senator Feinstein. Um, say aye. Pardon me? Aye. Yeah, uh, to say. I, I would like to support a yes vote on this. Um, it provides $823 billion. That's an increase of $26 billion for the Department of Defense. And the, it funds priorities submitted. Yeah, just say aye. Okay, just aye. Aye. <laughs> Thank you. So that is Senator Dianne Feinstein being told to just say I. So cut it with the commentary, just say it. Either because you're taking too long or because you don't know what's going on. I have been very critical of Dianne Feinstein for a lot of what she has done or not done since she's been a senator over the past few years. Um, I don't like that at all. I mean, I don't like the implications of it that it might be necessary. I don't like the implication that her staff has learned that like this has clearly been common enough that they know that this is the procedure to use. But I also just, I don't like that on a personal level. That seems wildly disrespectful. It's like she's not, she's not a meat puppet. You're not pulling the strings on her. Like, I don't know, Brett, I'm really conflicted. I obviously don't think that she should still be in elected office. They don't appear to think that she should still be in elected office, but I didn't I didn't like that. That seemed it seemed elder abusey. What do you think? Am I being wrong or weird? I don't like the the elder abusey. I don't think that felt elder abusey at all to me. It doesn't. That's a weird that's like yeah. calling it elder abuse is to me yeah. elder <laughs> abuse. Like that is just like Interesting. So like, woe is me, like that is. I don't think it's woe is me, but you didn't find that to be like really uncomfortably disrespectful? It wasn't uncomfortably, it, it, no? it had okay. to happen. Like it was already an embarrassing situation. What I saw is the person next to her talking to someone who's in experiencing dementia, the way that most people talk to someone who's experiencing dementia. You have to, you know, it's the old when you're an old person, it's second childishness, and you go and they're like, just say it, just say it, which is what they had to do to get it to the point where the you know proceedings could proceed. 
And, do, and you, everybody was just at a point that they shouldn't have had to be at is where, yeah, is, is where I'm including at. Us, including us, us, including everyone. It's just, it makes me, I get the ick when people are like, yo, this is elder abuse, what they're doing to her. It's like, well, I know your political agenda. That's why you're calling it elder abuse. It's just like, let's let's get past it. Um, <laughs> you don't like it, but but that, that's how it feels to agenda. me anyway. Okay, Um. yeah, so I look, I think that she should not be. Here, here's the issue. Obviously, you can't have a system where like you have to be tested or you lose your position. It's up to the people, you know, if they want to keep sending this person back for the third century or whatever. But um, I don't know. Like they clearly are just able to. It, it's not like the people don't get to find out, except for situations like this. She's not doing town halls. She's not meeting with constituents, going door to door. Like she's sequestered. Away with multiple layers of staff between her and anyone who has anything to do with her getting elected. Like they have basically created this shield between her and the people who need to understand whether she's capable of doing this job. And like, I don't know, like if there was a test that at least the results were released, is that too much? I know that that probably makes people uncomfortable, but. If we have people who are not mentally capable of doing the job, and yet there is so much money that you don't get to know that, that doesn't seem positive for democracy. The whole thing is just wildly uncomfortable. Yeah, Oh, it's just an indicator. It's like a plot point at this point to me. It's an yeah. indicator more than it is like something like, and what we're doing, the discourse that we're all having is like our, the only tool we should have because everyone, every other one is just a slippery slope toward like, yeah, yeah, I need you to do a physical aptitude test and a mental aptitude test. And I need to know that about you. They're all gonna yeah. be used as a cudgel anyway. Um, these are the things that sadly they come to, to light and, and we see them yeah. and they're clear as day and we have to make our, our decisions accordingly. It just, it, it felt like, it felt like worm tongue with Theoden, like it just felt like, this, this is not where we should be at as a democracy. Okay, with that said, we have basically no time. Let's jump into our last story. Representative Derek Van Orden, not likely to be popular with those working on Capitol Hill in the near future. He was exposed for apparently having absolutely lost his mind and his S all over a group of pages, who are, by the way, just teenagers. According to a transcript written by one of those teens, minutes after the incident, Van Orden called the pages jackasses and pieces of s and told them he didn't give an f who you are. The pages by the way are 16 and 17 year olds who work with the Senate, including perhaps very late into the day. And when they're not currently needed, they will wait in the rotunda, which is a standard thing. That's their tradition, he doesn't like it. He yelled at them, wake the F up, you little S's. What the F are you all doing? I, this is barely speech at this point. Get the F out of here. You are defiling the space, you pieces of S. Who the F are you? I don't give an F who you are. You just asked. Don't ask questions you don't want tough answers to. Uh, get out, you jackasses, get out. I'm adding the inflection, but I think we all understand that's what it was like. Um, he was angrier at those pages than I've ever been at anyone <laughs> in my life, Brett. <laughs> What is going uh, on with him? I think that is just absolutely insane. And the more of this I get into, I think we should all quit our jobs. <laughs> but I need more information about it before I make my decision. And you know, I want one of those so bad. How are you doing that? Fan. I don't know. It's just like I know myself, so I drop a bunch of and 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 and, and, and all the time. So I just have to have this on my speed dial. That reminds me of there's a scene in Arrested Development with Job, <laughs> where he's just listing those. Oh, like when he's berating the staff. Did you see anyway. at the beginning when I hit the mute button instead of the button? Oh no, uh, no I didn't. It got didn't really weird. That. Um, anyway. no, it, for me, honestly, I need more context. I need more con, and and by that I need it more transcripts written by John, read by John, because I, just, it I want. I don't want him to do that to the pages. They don't deserve that. Maybe the Republican pages, but um, no, they don't deserve that. But if he could like tear into like Louis Gomer and Marjorie Green, I'll read those transcripts all day long. Honestly, I'll, I'll just say this: when I was a kid, my dad was my basketball coach, and he like played in the Rose Bowl, and so he was very competitive. And so he would he took us into the wrestling room when we were trailing at halftime and cursed at seven eight year olds like this. 
And like the, when they had to tell us that it was almost time to go back for the second half, like the referee opened the door and just heard my dad going, "You plan like and on toast." <laughs> oh and we're all like that. And guess what? We went out the second half and we beat the Blue Devils. So sometimes that's what it took. Interns need a kick in the pants. Sometimes a little bit of verbal abuse is exactly what we all need. Anyway, that's all the time we have for the first hour, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Those of you watching live, we do have more to come in the aftermath. We'll be right back. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.